Now, what type of crimes were you committing? Um, <laughs> I, I'm not going to yeah. I'm not going to caution you here. Or but what type of crimes was your friend of a friend committing? When I joined the gang, it was more like deliveries of small amounts of drugs yeah. here and there. What that the Asian crime gangs? Yes, I joined the gang when I was in year seven. The reason why I got the attention of the gang members was because. Um, I was a junior black belt from a very young age. Oh, in what, what style? Taekwondo. Right, we're talking uh, bikies? More of the bikies, yeah. Okay. I, won't, I won't mention the name by then. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't mention the name, they might grab you again. Yeah. I got a knock on the door and I'm thinking that is room service. So I walk up to the door and you know, literally before I could open it, these guys come in wearing balaclavas and masks with machine guns and they all come running in and I'm just there going, oh, this isn't really my breakfast that I ordered. <laughs> cash was right next to me, so I've yeah. thrown the cash everywhere and beeline for the door. I get a machine gun to the side of the head. There's cash all around me, and then I hear the words, you're under arrest, this is the police. You know, I was talking to all these career criminals, and they were all talking about, you know, you got to expect to do a lot more jail if you want to go down this path or end up in a coffin. You got sentenced to 13... 13 years. 13 years. 13 years for direct and criminal enterprise. The I Catch Killers podcast was a fresh start for me as I left policing behind and started a new life. Over the years, we've laughed together, cried and shared some powerful moments. Welcome to I Catch Killers. Welcome to another episode of I Catch Killers. We love stories of redemption on I Catch Killers, and today's guest fits nicely into that area. See, today's guest was a prisoner, sent to prison for 13 years as a 21-year-old. Things happened in prison that changed his outlook on life. That included sharing a cell with a billionaire accountant. Today's guest is Joe Kwan. His story is fascinating, and today he's going to tell us all about it. Joe, welcome to I Catch Killers. Mate, appreciate you having me in. Grateful to be here. Well, it's uh, yeah, it's. I know you're a busy man, and uh, looking at all the stuff you've been up to, I'm surprised we got you in here. I've been trying to get you in here for a while. Uh, your name keeps popping up in the circles I mix that you're doing some uh, so good work. Mate, um, feels like a lot of the people that are coming out of the justice system who are doing a lot of uh, positive things in community kind of all know each other, you know. Um, you had Jeffrey Morgan on the show before. Yeah. You know, he was a mentor when I came out of prison as well, and I seen him on the show. You know, one of our guys from Confit, Andrew. Yeah, he's been on your show, so I'm well aware of what you're, you're doing with your with your podcast. It is some great stuff. Yeah, you were given some advice. I'll jump straight into it when you were in prison by a lot of uh, career criminals, and the general advice you were given that uh, if you want to be part of this game, expect to come back to jail more often. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, you know, I I got locked up when I was 21. Yeah. Um, and that was the only kind of life that I knew um, yeah. at that time. And, you know, when I first got locked up, you know, being a young adolescent, you know, that was my mindset, you know, let's become a career criminal because I don't know anything else, you know, expelled or dropped out of high school in year 10, no educational background, no family support. You know, what else am I going to do? You yeah. know, what, what What else do I know how to do? It's pretty stark advice, but isn't it? But it's a reality. You know, if you if you... If you're going to choose that life of crime, you are going to be spending uh, the well, payback is you're going to spend some time inside. Yeah, pretty much. You know, um, a lot of them did. You know, these guys, I looked up to them as like, you know, if you want to call it the 007s of the criminal world, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, you know, they're doing some pretty uh, crazy things like uh, hearing their stories. You know, when you go to jail, you hear a lot of people's stories and what the kind of crimes they yeah. did and how they operated. And I was dumbfounded going, wow, like that's next level stuff. And when I asked all of them, like, you know, like, have you guys done jail anywhere else? They were like, literally in their hands going, yep, this place, this place, this place. I'm like, well, if you guys are that good, why do you guys keep on getting locked up? And they were telling me, they go, there is no guarantee in this game. You know, if you want to be a part of this game in the criminal world, you ha you're stupid if you're not, if you don't expect to get caught, caught sometime. Yeah. If you don't have those expectations, you're living in denial. You yeah, know. most definitely. So was that a, a hearing that con like hearing the commentary come or or being perceptive enough to understand what they're talking about? Was that a wake up call for you? Oh, definitely. Because yeah. like you know, I was look, looking at a long stretch, um, given the my charges. Yeah. And I was like, look, I don't, I don't want to do more time. You know, when I get out, I don't want to do more time. I just jail's not a good place. You know, it's yeah. not, it's not a nice place. So I was, th I was just thinking. Well, what the hell do I do? Yeah. Do I keep on coming back to jail, and then I keep on hearing of all these people who are getting murdered and getting knocked? Did, did and... you do any time in uh, youth detention? No, or, I didn't. So that was your your first first yeah, experience in I was, custody. I was very lucky that I didn't go to um, any of the youth detention centres. Yeah. 
um, but I guess it all caught up to me um, on this <laughs> on this one, you know. Uh, first, first sentence, um, first ever charge, you know, thirteen yeah. years. It's a it's a big sentence. We'll we'll talk talk about that. But looking at you today and seeing what you're achieving today, you're such a positive positive person, and it's hard to reconcile who you were back in back in those those days. So, what was it? What's how did you find your way in the crime? Um, look, you know. So if you really want to take it back to the beginning, you know, yeah, my, yeah. my my mother, I, I grew up in a single parent household. Yep. Um, my mother came here as an international student. She was an opera singer. She got um, uh, a scholarship to the Sydney Conservatory. Oh, where, where, where did she originate from? From South Korea. Yeah. Yeah. So she came here with very little English. But an um, opera singer. And she's, oh, she's a bloody talented individual. Yeah. Um, and she was so hungry to chase her passion. Um, but you know, given that because she was on a student visa, she couldn't access any public housing or government support. So while studying full time, she was working four different jobs, trying to put food on the table to pay rent, pay for her tuitions and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you know, there wasn't much time for me to spend with my mother. So, you know, I'm always out and about and I was single, only child, no, no siblings. I had no kind of male guidance in my life. And, you know, I was always out on the streets and the people that I looked up to at that time and the only place my mum could afford were kind of like the rougher areas. Yeah. You know, and the people that I looked up to were all kind of, you know, getting up to no good. And, you know, these guys all had nice cars and they had the pretty girls around them and the and the mobile phones and the jewellery and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that kind of looked pretty cool to me. How, how old were you at that stage? I was primary school year one. Okay. All right. <laughs> very young. So, very young. And and you're thinking there's success. Yeah. That's a, the image of a successful successful person. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it, the environment you grow up fr- from a kid. You do look up to people and you you're not judging people, you're just looking up to them who yep. looks like they've got got all this stuff together. Yeah. And that uh, you just happen to be looking at the uh, crooks and thinking and they're the, the way they're off. They just seem like cool dudes, yeah. you know. I didn't know what else to expect, you know, but they were the people that were around me. Yeah. And they were really good to me and they were nice to me. So, like, they're the ones that I looked up to. I never saw the crime factor of things. I just thought, I just saw it as, man, these guys are like my brothers. They're really looking after me. I felt a sense of belonging with them. Yeah. Did you uh, think that at that age, if you had a role model or someone to keep you in line, and if it were a single mum working, you understand how, how hard that is with, with a child. Do you think if you had someone there, keeping you on the straight and narrow, you might have gone down a different path initially? Definitely. Yeah. You know, if someone really kind of, you know, if someone, if I looked up to someone that was really into sports and just really yeah. influenced me down that path, you know, I could have gone a complete different way, you know, but that wasn't around at the time for me. Yeah, so so it was, wasn't an option. So it, it, it could have changed the trajectory of your life. 100%. If, if you had that. You mentioned sport and that come, that's a big thing in the training and all that. I just, uh, just a sort of sideways uh, chat. I always think like team sport's good for kids too. You get, uh, you know, uh, kids there learning to be part of a team, working together is always a good uh, good way for kids to work out how to su- survive in society. Yeah, definitely. And you know, in sports, you know, kids always look up to the older boys or the older yeah. girls who are playing sports and they just admire them, how good they are and you want to become like them. Yeah. And it's very similar. Okay. Now, what type of crimes were you committing? Um, <laughs> I, I'm not going to yeah. I'm not going to caution you here. Or but what type of crimes was your friend of a friend committing? Um, look, you, you get into a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. It started off with your little, you know, petty thieving, um, and then you know we were stealing fireworks and selling off fireworks. Yeah. Um, stealing like in primary school, you won. I was I was selling porno mags. Right. You know, because there was one time when I actually came, came across a box of porno mags. Yeah. And I took it to my primary school and I started selling it in a one page, one dollar, two double page, a double spread page, two dollars. And I realized this was quite lucrative. Um, yeah. And then I started set, uh, stealing it from like the convenience stores and the and the magazine stores. Um, you know, little little harmless things like yeah. that. Um, then you know it started getting into a bit more like the kind of breaking into cars and you know and then when I joined the gang it was more like deliveries of small amounts of drugs yeah. here and there. Um, extortion on, on restaurants and shops and 
Yeah. Were, were, were that the Asian crime gangs? Yes. Okay. Correct. And and what did, were they structured? Like you're coming in as the uh, the kid and yeah. you, you're doing the run around. Yeah. And... You go through the whole initiation. Yep. Um, it was it was one of the triads. Yep. Uh, I'm not Chinese, mm. but there was a time when you know they they need a lot of foot soldiers, and that's when yep. kids like myself come come into play doing all the dirty work. And what type of initiations are we talking about? <laughs> um, I guess you know you've got other gang members that we have to go and kind of prove ourselves to. Yeah, I'll yeah. just leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Well, look, I, I'll talk in a general sense. There's some yeah. pretty uh, savage uh, fights there with uh, weapons and, and yeah. different things. That was that was the environment. Yeah, pretty much. What what area? Um, so I grew up in Campsie, yeah. so southwest, kind of southwest or inner west. Um, but we moved around a lot. So I was actually in Hornsby, in Eastwood, Airping, Stratfield, um, went to Bankstown and right. moved around a lot. You know. Okay. Well, I, I was a police officer at Hornsby. I'm just trying to do the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> there, finally caught you. Now, <laughs> at last. And uh, and I, I grew up around Epping too, so yeah. I, I, know, I know the area. Um, okay, so... Committing those crimes, I'm just trying to get into the mindset of you as a, a child committing those crimes. Did you know what you were doing was wrong? Did you have any sort of remorse about stealing or when it got a little bit further and, and fighting and, yeah? You definitely know it's wrong. Then you wouldn't be running. You right. know, when, when the incident happens, you wouldn't be running if you, yeah. if you didn't know that you're breaking the law. But you're so conditioned to that point that you're part of this culture yeah. that wrong becomes right you know in, in, i don't know if, you, if that makes sense but that's the kind of feeling that i had you know it's like you know societal norms yes it's wrong but within our culture it's just the way it is yeah did you but from a personal point of view did you think oh i wish i was doing something else or that didn't even i'm not a violent person naturally yeah. but you know the, um, sometimes you get put into those situations where yeah. you have to act out and you never sat right with me uh, that's why I never went down a kind of violent career path, you know, as, as yeah. a criminal. I never went down that path because that wasn't me. Uh, I never had it inside of me. Um, you know, being growing up under a single mother as well, um, you know, she's always taught me to protect women and, you know, because I respected my yeah. mom so much, you know. Uh, any violence towards women was like a big no-go for, for myself. Um, even like, you know, people who were much weaker than us, you know, yeah. um, that was um, considered a no-go as well. But, you know, you do get put into situations where, you know, it's part of your gang to go and fight other gang gang members and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I guess that's just part of being, a, you know, when you're young, you you kind of got raging with testosterone. Yeah, and you're bulletproof. Uh, yeah, and when you're, when you're put in that kind of negative environment, it just happens naturally. Yeah. yeah. Were you still at school when you were in the gangs? Uh, at the beginning, yes. Yeah. Um, I joined a gang when I was in year seven. Uh, I got expelled in year 10. Right. Okay, and then, so how did you make a living? Did you get any work or were you uh, just living off your criminal Yeah, small, small amounts. Like I was doing deliveries here and there. The, the drug deliveries? Drug deliveries. Yeah. Um, we were doing, we used to call it contracts, which means like you go and, you go and like kind of bash people and, you know, yeah. um, kidnap people and stuff like that. Uh, so there were little contracts here and there. You do um, little jobs for the older boys to just go smash up shop fronts. So just like breaking that. it down so people understand. So you're what, um, 14, 15, yeah. I suppose, at that. And uh, some higher up member of the gang says, okay, that crew over there has ripped us off the drugs. You've got to go get the drugs off off them. And Yeah, yeah. pretty much, you know. Um, we're, just, we're just little foot soldiers. Yeah. You know, I grew up as a foot soldier only because um, the reason why I got the attention of the gang members was because um, I, I was a junior black belt from a very young age. Oh, in what, what style? Taekwondo. Right, okay. Yeah, and, yep. you know, like I said, I grew up under a single mother and having no father figure. Um, so parents got divorced, yep. came here. I didn't even know they got divorced. Mum, so I was born here. Mum went back to Australia and she came back here by myself. Right. Um, by herself with me. Yeah. And she told me we were on holidays. <laughs> And then later on, I'm like, where's dad? And she goes, you're not going to be seeing him again. And then, you know, that really kind of cuts you up. And I was a one little ha, kind ha, of angry ha, boy. How, how old were you? That stage? Um, before, before primary school. Okay. Yeah. That's a hard bill yeah. to swallow at that yeah. age. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm always asking, I want to see dad. I want to see dad. And she goes, you're probably not going to see him again. Um, just suck it up. And, you know, I guess that was a bit of a kind of hole inside my heart that I needed to unleash and, you know, given that I had a junior black belt taekwondo yeah. <laughs> in, in taekwondo, um, you know, I kind of lashed out, you know, um, 
did a few round ass kicks back in the days <laughs> in school. <laughs> Okay, so that, that's always going to uh, get you get you an early exit yeah, from, yeah. from school. When did it get to the level? Uh, the, what sort of crimes were you committing? Because you, you didn't go to jail to twenty one. So what type of crimes were you committing between fifteen to twenty one? Was yeah, it escalating and yeah, your involvement so, getting heavier? And... Yeah, pretty much. It, it started off very small. Like I said, little deliveries here and there. You know, um, you're breaking shop fronts, little threats here and there. Yeah. Um, then it just got bigger and bigger um, because I knew. The, the larger the amount of drugs you were carrying for and the more money you were making. Yeah. You know, like at the age of like 13, you know, I was making a couple of thousand dollars just for like one drop. And what you were know? you doing with the money at that age? I literally were just going out and buying food and clothes and just spending it on, you know, when obviously we can't spend on alcohol, but yeah. we're spending on alcohol, having little house part running, like having house parties and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, um, just on stupid things. No one actually taught us like how to spend money. Right. You know, easy come, easy go from such a young age. Because it, it does give you a distorted view on money too, doesn't it? That's Here's right. Here's a thousand dollars that, uh, yeah. Yeah, and then, easy earning. And then you're yeah. shouting all the boys, you know, we're going for dinners and, you know. Did you ever come unstuck with police in in that early stage? I've been arrested a, a few times. As a juvenile? Yeah, I've been arrested a few times, yeah. but never really formally charged. Okay. And what, you got a caution or, yeah, or caution, whatever? caution. Been locked up in the fish tank at the police station. Yeah. Had to get mum to come and pick me up and, you know, things like and, that. And when you got locked up, did that... Uh, that a wake up call for you at all? Or? Not really. It's just, oh, this is easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're 18, 19, you're, you're delivering more drugs. Are you working at all? Have you got any uh, regular employment or is no, it? No, no. I, I actually did. Uh, when I was 18, I did work at uh, a bar. Yeah. So I had got my RSA and I was working at a bar and realized mm. I hate this job. Um, yeah. And, you know, there was a comparison. I'm making more money doing this. Why should I be working? Yeah. You know, and where are you going to make that age, make that amount of money at that age? That's you know? uh, that's part of the attraction, isn't it, to yeah. to crime? I, I see people get dragged into that. In that, it's so easy to get the money in crime. When you when you look back a little bit wiser, you realise you'll probably if you put as much effort into your crime as you did into uh, exactly. working, you would have made the same exactly. amount of money. Yeah. But uh, okay, you came un- you came unstuck. What what happened there when you got arrested? Yeah. So you know, I was. So I got into the whole like um, party scene. Yeah. Um, so obviously you're at a young age from in, around my circles, like the cocaine, the ice, it wasn't big, but ecstasy, MDMA, MDMA was a big thing because when I first came across it was at an underage dance party. Right. Um, I tried it for the first time and when everyone was going, this feels so good, I'm thinking, this is so good. How do I make money off this? Right. You know, um, it just started like that. Uh, and then because it just everything just fit in at that time with the with the networks that I had with the guys that were similar age to me, we had a big network and we were able to distribute that way. Yeah. Um, it just kind of made sense to us to do it. Um, and then you and know, so you you'd rock up to the parties, the rave parties or or dance parties, yeah. and uh, you'd have the drugs and just yeah. So that's how we it. first started. You know, we just went in with like our pockets full of just. And pit. was this still affiliated with the gangs, or had you yes. broken away? Yeah, at that time, yeah. yeah. So we had like pockets full of pills, and we'd be selling it, and um, yeah. And then one time I did do a drop um, in Western Australia um, for for a gang, and I, I got held. You could call it being kidnapped, but I got I got held. Yeah. Um, for kind of like for ransom, telling these guys because they gave them a shit batch before and they were, they were demanding money okay. and they were holding me for ransom. So, so you, you're being held captive over there in WA. How old were you at the time? So I think I just turned 17. Okay. And how, how long did they keep you? It was about two, about two and a half days. Okay. It, it sounds like we're talking uh, bikies. One of the bikies, yeah. Okay. I, won't, I won't mention the name, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't mention the name. They might grab you again. Yeah. Talk, talk, talk us through that one. So <laughs> did you jump on a plane or drive across? Um, we, ca- we caught uh, a plane across. Yeah. Um, and then, um, yeah, we just, uh, back then, there weren't that many sniffer dogs or anything, yeah. and it was just so it was so easy. Different story now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so went there uh, to do a drop, and then those guys, I had, I had no idea. I thought it was just a drop off and just come. They you, help. Dro- you drop the drugs off, they give you the money. Yeah, and I was going to come over, yeah. and then they just held me there. Over in Perth. Yeah, threatening me, saying like, you know, your, your guys gave a shit badge, we they're demanding more money and all that kind of stuff. I had no idea what was going on. Um, and, you know, they took me to, I don't know if it was a clubhouse or the area where they were just staying at. Yeah. Um, but they actually like fed me and <laughs> they looked after me. I never got roughed up or anything. Yeah. Like a little bit of threat here and there. Um, but, you know, the boys, um, they were calling them, no answer, nothing. And then 
They go, you know, you could be getting like tortured right now, and your boys haven't even replied back. They're not even. They don't even care about yeah. you right now. They, they pretty much left you for dead, if, if, uh, as far as they know. You know. Yeah. So and it just kind of got to me, going, you know what? I'm taking all this risk for these guys, you know. But I'm I'm the one, you know, that's you know going to be. So you you got released from that. Yeah. Pretty but, much. Yeah. And when I got back. And because I was doing all this stuff and I had all the networks, I'm like, well, why don't I just do this myself? You know, there were other, there were other, a lot of other factors that were making me think about, you know, going away from these guys. Um, and, and I think that was just a kind of pivotal moment for me to go, you know what, let's, let's just branch off from these guys. Came with a lot of issues. Yeah. Um, but, you know, over time, those issues well, were it, solved. It's a, it's a dangerous world. And you talk about the time you were held and because uh, of the quality of the drugs and, and that, and you were treated well and, and released. I, I've done murder investigations where people have been killed because of the quality of the drugs and yeah. someone's come up to collect and it, it ends up in a shootout and someone someone's dead. Yeah. And uh, bodies dumped out, out in the ocean. Like, it, it's a rough world. Yeah. I just, I just feel, I, I, to me, I was thinking maybe because I was so young, I, I looked yeah. like a little bit of a baby, but they kind of like they didn't left see me alone. A, didn't yeah. see you as a threat. Yeah, they just wanted to send a message to my guys. Um, why, uh, why they let you leave? I have no idea because they, they couldn't get in contact and they got sick of you. Pretty much, um, and I'm pretty sure they had things to do as well. <laughs> um, and they did say to me, they go, look, you know, um, the. Why they up as they were letting me go? They go, your brothers don't even care about you. Yeah, and yeah. that was the thing that really hit me. Yeah, you know, stay with me, and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to get out. But I, I've, I've got to ask you, like at that age, so you're in your twenties, nineteen, twenty, or whatever. What makes you think you can compete in that that world with all the inherent dangers and risks? Was it just naivety? Or it was. was it... it was being naive. Uh, it was just being young and just being very ambitious. Uh, and that's my personality. I've always been like that since I was young. That's my character. You know, they call it an entrepreneurial spirit or what you want to call it. But um, I just well, thought, it, I just sa- it started with your uh, your pornography <laughs> magazine selling a double page for a dollar. <laughs> yeah, and it's saw an opportunity. You know, uh, we had the market and we had the suppliers. I was like, why not? Let's go for it. So you got a crew together. I had a crew together, all similar age. Some some were younger than myself. Um, you know, one of my co-offenders, um, he was 17 years at the time. Right. Um, a family friend of mine, you know, doing his HSC. And he, he was actually buying off these other guys and getting totally ripped off. And I was like, why are you getting it from them? You might as well just join our crew and be with us. Yeah. You know, um, just stuff like that. People that we could trust. And we started taking it to schoolies which actually was the start of how we, we started really getting big. You know, we'd right. drive up two weeks before schoolies, before they were doing all the road checks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll settle in. And then, you know, the first time we took up like about, you know, 10,000, it literally disappeared in two days. And we're the, like... Uh, the ecstasy? Ecstasy yeah. tablets. Yeah. Um, and we didn't even have enough for ourselves because we wanted to party as well. Right. We didn't even have enough for ourselves. Did, did you think at this time, and I know you're a, you're a deep thinker and reflecting, but at that time, did you think you were doing something morally wrong? Like you knew it was criminally wrong, but you you took ecstasy yourself. You, you liked the drug, selling it, to, selling it at schoolies. Did you, you think about that? No. Because at that time, because me and all my friends were taking it as well, yeah, and we never thought that ecstasy was going to be a, a dangerous drug. You know, right. like, we we kept on telling ourselves, well, it's not like heroin. People don't get addicted to this. You know, it's not like ice. You know, um, either way, even if we don't do it, they're going to get it anyway. They're going up there to get on, you know, party drugs yeah. like this and alcohol. So that's the way you're processing, processing that, exactly. it through your your, your exactly. mind. Okay, so it's all going well. You're, you're making your money. You've yeah. you identified your market. You're yeah. running running your business. How did it How did it come unstuck? Um, so, long story short, um, this carried on for a few years. Um, so every schoolies, the next schoolies was we did we did a bigger bigger batch. Yeah. Um, then we were doing a lot of the festivals, um, and just we just started hitting up all the festivals, clubs, and any kind of large events. That's what we were doing. And we just became a wholesaler after a while. And with that, uh, how much money were you making? Were you living a good life? Uh, as in... Like I said, money come, money go. You know, I had did a... You have, I, uh, I had a you know, renting a place? Yeah. Or? So I, um, I was 18. I had a three-bedroom apartment on Sussex Street in the city. You know, I was leasing a car. I never bought a car under my name. I was always yeah. leasing our cars. Um, my friend had um, access to a lot of fake IDs, so we were like, you know, releasing cars out through fake IDs and all that kind of stuff. So you you were living living the high life, 
call it you could call it high life. Um, yeah. but you know, you know, kid at that age, you it's very rare to see that kind of money. Yeah. You know, yeah. um always had an entourage around with me. Um, so you think, you know, uh, you know, when you're young, you think you're unbreakable and you, yeah. you think you're on top of the world. You know, there was one time when I was that off my head on, on, on pills, you know, someone's asking me for pills. I'm telling them to go away because I've only got two left and I'm trying to empty out my pockets and all this cash is falling out. And he's like, oh, cash is falling out. I'm like, go away. And I kept yeah. on throwing cash out. You know, I'll leave the house with like $5,000 in my pocket and I'll be like, I want to come back with nothing in my pocket. So just, I always just, end up at the casino but, and yeah, stuff like that. Did it's any, very stupid. Did any uh, paranoia kick in that do you, you get one day the cops are going to kick the door in? Like it, it's, you must be looking over your shoulder. Uh, you know what you learnt from your, your inmates in prison when you went in there? You've got to be prepared to do time if you're going to play this game. Did you consider that or was that just youthful exuberance where you uh, you didn't consider? You know, when it doesn't happen, um, you think that it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, and that's why I, that's why you need like like role models. Even in the criminal world, you've got all the role models telling you all this constantly, you know, keeping you on your toes and telling you all this stuff. Yeah. You know, if you're mucking up, like you're, this is what you're doing wrong. You know, I think half the time we were just like off our faces so much as yeah, well. well. Like for for policing, if you you got some young blokes all living the living the high life, flashing cash around, and you you're looking for a source of uh, where the drugs is coming from, there's a path to follow. So how how did you get caught? Yeah, so um, one of my co-offenders, um, so he met a group where they were washing the money for us so turning it into clean money yep. and they were putting it into a, a it was like i think it was a trust account or some sort of bank account where they were paying us as like contractors for for overseas company yep. um, so we'll give them money that they were taking about seven percent and then they'll tr- uh, they'll wash that money and give it to us back in ca- uh, clean money into account so like sweet so he used to take cash over in like ramyon you know the the Asian noodle boxes yeah. and he'll take it over. And then not little did I know that this, this lady who he was seeing, um, was doing it for like a couple of the syndicates. Um, and then, um, he ended up having relations with her. Right. Um, and then he started to opening his mouth because they were getting on the rack and everything <laughs> together, um, open his mouth. And then they kind of followed him like, who's this guy? Um, and then, it happens from there. So yeah. like they've latched on, um, investigation starts finding out who's who they put like undercovers, uh, to come and, you know, kind of infiltrate us. Yeah. And, yeah. And then next, uh, next minute I'm doing a deal at the Shangri-La hotel. Um, and you know, I always do a deal. Uh, I used to always do deals at hotels and then I'll order myself like a breakfast. If it was a morning time, yeah. I'll order myself some alcohol, whatever through room service. And it was a, it was morning time at that time. And I ordered, I still remember I ordered room service, um, uh, a big breakfast and a long black and yeah. orange juice and you know I still had cash in the room on the coffee table and I got a knock on the door and I'm thinking that is room service so I walk up to the door and you know literally before I could open it these guys come in wearing balaclavas and masks with machine guns and they're all come running in and I'm just there going, oh, this isn't really my breakfast that I ordered <laughs> um, but the second thought is crap I'm going to get I'm getting robbed here so I, the, the cash was right next to me. So I've yeah. thrown the cash everywhere. I'm beeline for the door. I get a machine gun to the side of the head. Yeah. And I'm pretty much concussed on the floor and there's cash all around me. And then I hear the words, you're under arrest. This is the police. Okay. And literally everything's in slow-mo and I had a hundred dollar note stuck to my face and getting <laughs> hogtied. And, and literally I'm looking out the window and remember I told you my mum was an opera singer. Yeah. So she used to always take me to the opera house as a treat. Okay. Um, you know, she'll she'll get her hands on some opera tickets and she'll always take me to the opera house, you know. Yeah. Um and I, I could see the opera house um outside the through the window of the hotel where I was getting arrested and literally I just had this moment of fuck, I've taken everything for granted. Right. You know. Um Mum's coming to, you know, work so hard and, you yeah. know, chase her dreams and I'm just here fucking around and Is that you know, the fir- first time you had that sort of feeling? Pretty much the first time, and every time I talk about it, you know, it just kind of gets me. Yeah. You know, um, you're getting a bit teary now <laughs> talking no, about I, it as well. I, no, it, I understand it. It's a, a painful thing, and yeah, you realise at that point the consequences yeah. of your actions and the people that you love it's impacted on. Yeah, 100%. So, 
How how did your mum take it when she found out that you were locked up? So when I got arrested, she was back in South Korea. So she got right. remarried and she moved to South Korea. So yep. I'd call her maybe every once a week, um, yeah. maybe twice a week, you know, just to tell her like I'm doing okay. But she she knew that I was um, always mingling with the wrong crowd, um, and she knew the type of crowd that I was mingling with. Yeah. Um, then when I went radio silent or comm silent for about three months, I told all my friends. Don't tell my mum, because all my friends know my mum as well. Like, they treat her like their mum. Yeah. I said, don't tell my mum. I'm pretty sure I'm going to work my best to try to get bail every time I got bail refused, right? right. I'm going to get bail. I'm going to somehow get out of here. This is going to be all right. It's denial again, right? Yeah. So you're, you're in that denial mindset at, at the start. Everyone thinks that they're going to get bailed and get out. Um, <clears throat> didn't happen. Um, and then one day, I get a I get a visit at Parkley Correctional Centre. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd been in a fight and I had a black guy and busted up lips and cut up hands everywhere. And I'm thinking it's one of the boys and I walk out and it's my mum sitting there. Oh, and I'm right. just going, crap. That was broken. That and heart. she's just sitting there, just yeah. motion. It's like no emotions, just sitting there. Yeah. And I was like, how'd you find me? And my, 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 one of my best friends, um, apparently told her yeah. because I had, I gave in. You know, I gave in because um, your mum came and she went on her knees and she goes, if my son's in a ditch somewhere, I want to know right now. You yeah, know? Fair enough. And he goes, give fuck, you I, can't, I, can't, yeah. I can't continue with this. So he's told her. So she's come for that visit. Um, and the whole time she's visiting, you know, this is how strong a mother is, right? Uh, the whole time, you know, she didn't break a tear, nothing. She's just saying, you know, you're looking after yourself. Are you eating? You know, how you doing? All that kind of stuff. She didn't ask, why did you do it? Anything like that. Yeah. She just goes, just look after yourself. And she's a very religious lady and she just goes, you know, focus on your faith, you know, while you're in here. And yeah. as she left, you know, I was walking in and all the visitors get put into one room before they get let out. Yeah. And I turned back and I could just see my mom just breaking down. Right, she's you know, been stoic in front of you. But, uh, that was, you know, that was a bit of a heartbreaker as well. And, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking, man, you know, how, how did it get to this? That has to hurt. Yeah. Yeah. So... You first, uh, you you get arrested, taken to the police station. You uh, get bail refused. You're on the, the truck on the way out to uh, prison. What was that like? Because you, you had sometimes people have experienced, uh, you know, child detention, youth detention, and so it's not that big a step. What was there fear going through your mind? Yeah. So look, we, I didn't know what to think, Gary, um, because you know I went straight to Surrey Hills Police Station. Yeah. Uh, I overstayed my visit because like all the all the you were meant to be there for like a couple of days to a week. I stayed there for two weeks. Um, if you know Surrey Hills Police you Station, you don't want to stay there for two weeks. It, you hardly get any showers. Maybe once a week or cut every couple of days they give you a shower. Yeah. No toothbrush. You're in the same clothes and undies that you you're in when you first got arrested. Um, there's fluorescent light all day, and then there's this TV that just you can't hear any sound. It just fuzzes and these lines going through it. So it's more like. It does your head in. You can't even watch... TV's on, but you can't even watch TV. I, right? Look, I, I, I know those cells. I've, I've seen those cells. It's, yeah. it's just a foreboding place. And, and you've got people coming in that are coming off um, heavy drugs, yeah. like ice, heroin, and you just see all, all sorts of crazies there. And when I was in that fish tank, um, there was a guy that was literally just um, in a fetal position facing the wall the whole time, lying yeah. down. And I honestly thought he was dead. And I went and kicked him and he kind of moved So because he didn't move for so long. And I think it was the second day he he hardly moved and he all of a sudden went to the toilet. I yeah. mean, toilet meaning this metal thing with like gangrene stuff growing yeah, around it. Yeah, disgusting. Yeah, and um, he starts doing a number two, so I'd like never seen an open toilet like this before. Yeah. So I turned around to give him some privacy and he starts making like these screaming sounds. I turn around, he's got his feces in his hand and started bronzing himself. Right, okay. Around the wall and everything. Wipe, wiping it all uh, over yeah. himself. Um, and he was just, I think obviously dealing with a lot of mental health issues yeah. and, you know, a cry for attention. At that time, I was just thinking, what the hell is this place? And that was my first time in. Yeah. But that wasn't even prison yet. <laughs> that was the holding cell before going to prison. That's right? just getting you, getting you ready for prison. Yeah. And then you go on the escort truck and, you know what? The escort truck was a little bit more comforting. You know, you meet a lot of people um, that are coming in for the first time and a lot of people who are kind of seasoned, kind of <laughs> yeah. seasoned inmates, if you want to put it. They do jail well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And um, they kind of you know teach you you know oh your jail's not gonna be like Surrey Hills you get fed there you get you get a television you know um they give you blankets and all that kind of stuff yeah. and you know you get showers and you know it sounded pretty good um 
and that they put you kind of in this um, unit. How, how should I say it? It's like a like a new intake unit. Yeah. So you know when you buy uh, a goldfish from the aquarium, you know they give it to you in like a plastic bag, yeah. right? And then they put it into um, the your oh, then you to, go, you, to yeah, acclimatize yeah, fil- filter into it. Yeah, yeah. So you to acclimatize the temperature, then you yeah. release it into the big um, big tank. That's what it was like. We were like the new fish, you know. Yeah. They put us in this unit, which was like the, the plastic bag, and then they put you into the main. Um, and then walking into the main was the most intimidating thing um, ever because I was still, you know, I just turned twenty-one years yeah, old. Yeah, you're a kid. Uh, I've been around crime, but I've never seen this kind of. This yeah. was next level, you know. You, you had like big ass blokes just all shirts off Every, yeah. for some reason I don't know why everyone has their shirt off in jail <laughs> you know? everyone's just jacked up training all day you know doing boxing in the yard you know doing push ups pull ups you know playing cards and it's just like well, in the cops we could tell someone that uh, just got out of jail because they come out muscled up and suntanned <laughs> <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah, yeah. yeah and you walk in and it's um, and everyone's staring at you you yeah, know, it's, as intimid- you it's intimidating place. Yeah, yeah. so you know, I, I, that was the kind of feeling that I got when I first when I first walked into the main. It was yeah. um, quite intimidating, but it you just get used to did it. Did you uh, were you uh, the racial divides in there? Yes, there was. Uh, little did I know there was something going on between the the indigenous group, the Kuris, mm. and the Asians. Um, so all the Asians are in uh, when I was there uh, in two thousand and seven, um, Parkley. So yep. area two, that's when all the where the, all the Asians were. It was yep. a working unit, so it was more of a privileged unit. And then you had area one, which is right you could see right across. So that was a non-working unit. Did you did you know people in there? In the working unit, uh, mm. I knew people. Yep. But to get there, you have to put your name down from Area 1. It takes about two weeks. Yeah. Um, once a bed placement comes becomes available, then they'll move you across depending on what how, how far you are on that list. Yeah. You know? Now, when, you, when you're in there, you said when your mum came to visit you three or four months into the um, prison sentence, you had been in a fight. What was that uh, fight about? Oh, it's just like at the start, you know, you just kind of... I feel... Because it was remand centre. Yeah. Um, I feel like inmates are much more on edge uh, during remand because you know it's your you've, you're fresh in you know it's a huge life change uh, and everyone's just in a very unstable place. Fresh in and you think you could get out ne- next week or you might be found not guilty. There's yeah, not sorts. just that. It's just it's just real relationships with on um, people with yeah. out, on the outside. You know, a lot of people were running businesses that now uh, have now you know been destroyed or they've lost it you know they've been with partners who are now lo- no longer with, with them yeah you know they want to take the kids away from them and all sorts of issues right um phone calls was the worst thing you know you hear you just hear people on the phone just you know losing it you know um, everyone just like you know like a like a melting pot at that point you know and any little thing just can tick someone off well it, it's such a hard thing and i i think the goes to the experience of being in prison you're taken away from family friends and you've got absolutely no control yeah. so if you're having an argument with your partner and you have no idea what your partner's doing it just you pl- play with that sit with that in your mind when you're in jail yeah imagine this like your partner just goes i don't want to be with you anymore i found someone else yeah you'd be going crazy in there yeah. right um and you're exactly you're powerless to do anything and that's the thing about prison you know physically it's it, it's not it's not that hard Yep. You know, you're getting fed, you've got, a, you've got a bed to sleep in, you've got a roof over your head. How hard can it be physically, right? Yeah. It's a psychological warfare that you you got to go through. When that cell door closes every night, you know, and you're in maximum security at that time, you know, you get locked in at 3 o'clock to 8 o'clock the next day. You know, if you're not in a good mind space, you're having a lot of trouble um, being able to cope you know, you're gonna if you don't have any positive coping mechanisms, you just go down a, a, a rabbit hole, you know, um, of just negative thoughts, and that just really eats away at your soul yeah. when that happens. Yeah, I, I can imagine that it, it must be uh, like a living nightmare, just the the mental mental yeah. side of it. Yeah. 
You uh, eventually got um, uh, to share a cell with a cellmate that changed your life, and it's an interesting story. You want to tell, <laughs> tell us about that? Because it's a real sliding, do- sliding door moment in your life, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Remember, like I said, you know, I was talking to all these career criminals, and they were all talking about, you know, you've got to expect to do a lot more jail if you want to go down this path or end up in a coffin, you know, and I didn't want that. Yep. And But what else did I know how to do? You know, I was uneducated, hardly any family support in, in Australia. Um, what else am I going to do? I didn't have any work experience. Um, something else caught me was when I still was trained in jail. Yeah. And one of the guys that went out and trained, um, was, was training in our group. He got out and he came back literally a couple of months back in, back into our training group. And I was like, Mate, you why are you back? Out. Why are you back? And something he said to me that really, really got me was people out in there, out in society do not accept people like us. And I was like, okay, explain to me more. Yeah. I go, I try to become square, wash my hands, and I got myself a job. But the only jobs that I could get is these, like, jobs where people are looking down on you. You know, they treat you like a second-class citizen. Yeah, the ex-prisoner. Yeah. Um, and the moment you try to go into a new circle, or because he wants to get out of that circle and meet new people, like a new social circle, yeah. the, the, the guards go up straight away, you know. Um, yeah. They're never going to open up to you fully, you know. So... Um, he inevitably just went down that path because, you know, he was getting rejected everywhere. You know, it was a sad thing to hear about because I could see myself being that when I got out. Genuinely tried to make a go at going straight. There was no opportunities for this guy. There was no support. And I saw myself in that same position and I was like, crap, what do I do? Anyway, and Cause, I was, uh, sorry, because we've fast forwarded. We've, we've got you in jail, but we haven't even got you convicted. Mm-hmm. You ended up, you got sentenced to 13, 13 years. 13, 13 years. years for director and criminal enterprise. Yeah. Okay, that, that's a big, uh, big lagging that for a 21 year old. Yeah. So yeah. I, the bottom sentence was nine years. So I served nine years. Yeah. But um, my whole parole, including my parole term, was 13 years all up. Okay. Yeah. So going back to um, how I met this guy, I was at this um, point in my life where I wanted to change. Yeah. I wanted to do something different, but I just didn't know what to do. No one told me what to do, you know, or how to do it. And one day I was reading this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and, um, you know, by Robert Kiyosaki. And it says in the book that accounting is the language of business. And, you know, I know a lot about, a bit about criminal business, yeah. but wh- wh- why don't I teach myself this accounting thing? You know, maybe it might help me to go legit. Yeah. You know, um, another reason why I wanted to, why I had a bit of a interest in education was, you know, when I looked around the whole yard, you know, the common denominator for why everyone was incarcerated was the lack of education. Yeah. Of course, there's a lot of childhood trauma and disadvantage, but including myself, I was a part of this statistic. No one, no one... Hardly anyone graduated from high school. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. And, you know, when they say they want more police and crack down on law and order, I, I, I'd feel better if we're pouring into education. And exactly. And really trying to work yep. hard to make sure every every kid gets an education. Because yep. I've, I've saw that through my career. And so you, yep. you're saying stuff that I 100% agree with. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen that firsthand and I was a part of that too. So I was like, okay, well, why don't I go teach myself this accounting thing? So I read that book and it sounded really interesting, right? Yeah. So I went to the prison library and got myself an accounting textbook. Um, it was like a first year university accounting textbook. And as soon as I opened it up, I flicked through a few pages and I started sweating uh, because everything looked like hieroglyphics to me. I didn't understand a single thing and I felt so frustrated because I felt so stupid. Yeah. You know, and as soon as I started, I just wanted to give up. But, you know, you sometimes, sometimes in life, you're meant to meet certain people. Yeah. You know, um, you know that some people come along to really help you to change your life, you know, and you're meant to seize those moments. And I feel like I did. Um, this guy walked into the yard that day and the rumor was that he was a billionaire accountant. Yeah. You know, everyone latched onto the word billionaire and they wanted to go extort this guy. Yeah. I latched onto the word accountant and I'm thinking maybe this guy might be able to help me. Maybe he's my ticket out of here, you yeah. know, kind of thing. So I went up to him and I said, look, um, we can help each other, you know. Um, I'll make sure that no one lays a finger on you yeah. uh, and give you the protection of all the boys. But in return, you teach me accounting every day. That um, was a, the deal. Was, that was the best proposition that I yeah. put, put before him. And he, and, he, and he latched onto that. And not long after, we ended up becoming cellmates, yeah. you know. Um, and not only did he teach me accounting every day, but it taught me about business. It taught me about the value of education. But the greatest thing it taught me was about self-worth. Yeah. You know, it was 
very ironic how I had to find my first positive mentor in a prison cell. Um, you know, and he actually even taught me, um, told me to, he motivated me to do my HSC while I was inside. So I did my HSC and, um, and then, you know, it was just seeing someone that had such a different lifestyle and so, so much intellect, yeah. which I'd never come across. You know, he was not just an accountant, he was a lawyer as well. You would have been like a sponge. I was a sponge. I just wanted to learn. I wanted to learn. But in the, in that process, we ended up becoming really good friends. Yeah. Uh, there were so many commonalities. You know, we shared the same faith as well. Um, and then, yeah, so we ended up parting ways. I did my HSC. He, he made me read books every night. That was a game changer. I used to never read books. Yeah. Uh, to this and, day. And I, what, so I'm just trying to picture it. You two in the cells and he'd be like, here, Joe, I want you to read this book. He'd tell me to read it. And he'd go, yeah. what's this book about? And I'll tell him and I'd go, wrong. Just think about it again. And wow. it'll just quiz me like that all the time. And it go, right, okay, explain a bit more about it. And, and they go, well, can you analyze it a bit more? You know, it'll make me always think, you know. And the thing about what he taught me was in life, it's not about, to. you don't have to be smart. It's about how much you think about something. You know, he taught me how to think and problem solve. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I've never done that before. And I've never finished anything before, but he got me to do my HSC. Anyway, we ended up splitting ways. We, we went to different correctional centers. Yep. Um, and I ended up at Wellington Correctional Center, which is about five hours inland of New South Wales. It's one of the regional centers. Yep. Um, and I, was, I still remember that day, I was playing cards with the boys out in the unit. And this prison officer walks up to me, hands me this letter, and he goes, Quan, I don't know how you did it, but you bloody did it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> out of curiosity, I just took this letter into my cell. Um, and as I opened it up, he said, congratulations, you've been admitted into the University of New South Wales. Wow, wow. Crazy man. Was that, that at Wellington Prison or, was, or Macquarie? That was at Wellington. 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 I was yeah. in maximum security there because um, okay. there was some there was some allegations and we got moved back to uh, maximum security. But, you know, I was sitting in that cell and as I read the letter, I remember, you know, that whole time since I got sentenced, I never shed one tear mm. because, you know, I always accepted, okay, this is the consequences of my actions. Um, but when I was sitting in that cell, I was grabbing onto that letter and I was bawling my eyes out because, you know, no one would understand the feeling of freedom yeah. that I was feeling in that moment, you know. Because, because of that letter? Because the amount of work that I put into it and I knew that that was my ticket out of this life. Yeah. That was my changing moment, you know. That was my key out of here. How I, I can see you, how emotional you are just thinking about it. But yeah, mm. getting that, that that education and uh, yeah, f full credit to you because there's a lot of distractions in prison. But if you can make yeah. uh, make uh, something worthwhile doing that, you also um, uh, after the HSC while still in prison, you you enrolled in the uni course as well. Yeah, so I got enrolled, I got accepted into UNSW and then I just deferred Yep. because I wanted to do, instead of, you know, when you get to your C3, so like your minimum security, yep. um, you've got an option. So if you've done good, if you've proven your behavior and you get to C3, they'll yep. put an ankle monitor on you Yeah. Um, and then you can go out either work or you can go study. Yeah. I wanted to go down the study path. Um, so our case officers had this whole plan of me yep. going to Long Bay so I could go to UNSW for Long Bay. It's up the road. It's yeah. one bus ride, right? Yeah. Um, and when I got there, the superintendent in, in charge goes, there's no way I'm going to send you to Long uh, to UNSW. He made it his mission not to send me. Um, okay. And he kept on saying, you're a crim. Just go work. You're too old to be studying. You yeah. know, and that put fire in my belly to want to do it even more. When you're told you can't. Yeah. yeah. And I remember there were times when like squad used to come in and rip up my textbooks and stuff like that. And, you know, sometimes people will be breaking down, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to go even more. I'm going to go and do it even more, you know? That's so that, just... uh, that's what you're up against in there, all, all yeah. the distractions of, it, of surviving in prison. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, some resentment there. Look, I, you get, you know, you get good prisoners, you get bad prisoners, you get good corrective services, officers right. and bad ones. Were there any uh, uh, people there that were encouraging, whether it be crooks or corrective services oh, officers? Man, I met so many staff that were yep. so um, encouraging. I'm, yep. I'm in touch with them today. That's till cool. today, you know, on LinkedIn wow. and they see what I'm doing now and a lot of them are like, we're, we're so proud um, that we actually, you know, did this for you, you know, yeah. we encouraged you and yeah, it must be a proud moment for them, you know, like because there's not that many inmates that actually go out and actually come back to try change the system. Yeah. 
You said when you were in the cell with your me and air mate or be an air mate yeah. and uh, the value of, of self-worth. And yeah. uh, that's, I think, if someone shows some faith in you, whether it's uh, yeah, uh, your cellmate or a prison officer, yeah. how much difference that makes. Oh, it's crazy. You yeah. know, um, I think self-worth is something that, you know, a lot of young men and even women these days, but from what I can relate, uh, men lack. Yeah. Um, but if you don't grow up with a, like a kind of male role model that's showing you that yeah. you're able, you're capable of doing things. Um, and you know, that's why I think I got into a lot of trouble when I was young because I just didn't have the right role models to, to give me the confidence to do something that I'm proud of doing. Yeah. You know, um, and then, you know, he was the first one to show me that, you know, he believed he, that I can do it even though I didn't believe in myself. Well, if you get told constantly you can't do this or you're no good, you're no yeah. good, it, it just it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. 100%. You, you, just, you start to believe that all the negativity that's around you. Yeah, correct. Um, yeah, and, and look, that's part of what okay. I do now. You know? So when you, uh, when you uh, were released from prison, how had you changed as a person? What, what year was this you released? So I was released to uh, November uh, 2017. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when I got released, um, so that was after doing works release. Yep. Um, I got released from Long Bay Correctional Center. Um, and look, I didn't have a place to go. So yep. I rented out this place in uh, Lidcombe. Uh, it was one of those, there were three houses remaining on a street that was all apartment Bend. blocks. Yeah. And they were the last three houses and they were due to be demolished soon. So it was pretty much like a dilapidated house. Yeah. Um, and I was able to rent a room for very cheap. Um, but the problem was there was like no, no hot water. So if the, if the first person had a shower, you're not going to get hot, you're not going to yeah. get hot water, you know? Little did I know the you know the health benefits of having cold showers, but I was yeah, swearing. Now, now people are putting them, putting them in the bathroom, taking yeah. hot water out. But I was swearing back then, you know, during yeah. winter, I'd be freezing my ass off. But you know, I was still um, so motivated to to go to university. So I, I, literally a month after I got out of prison, yeah. I enro- like I was enrolled in to go to university. I was doing my full time uh, studies in a bachelor of commerce. Right, and I still remember um, my first course that I did uh, was called Creating Social Change. It was an undergraduate business course that I had to do, um, and in that course they were talking about recidivism rates and disadvantaged societies in Australia and the crime rates and all that kind of stuff and yeah. how business can solve social issues. And that was the first subject that I did, and it was through a lecturer called um, Dr. Ali Walker who was doing the lecture, and literally I approached her after and I went, "Hey, um, I just came out of Long Bay." No, not long ago, yeah. I loved your lecture. Um, I've got this business idea. And she was just looking at me going, Did this, is this guy even in my class? Who is this man? <laughs> yeah. But I explained to her and everything and she, she thought it was fascinating and she actually um, put me in contact with Center for Social um, Impact, which yeah. was based at UNSW. Um, and they turned my idea into a case study for an MBA program. And these MBA students helped me to develop what Confit is what, today, okay, which is a social enterprise. Well, we're going to talk. That's yeah. uh, in part two. We're going to talk all about uh, yeah. what you're doing with Confit and all the other amazing stuff you've done and the scholarships. And because I think it's one of the biggest turnarounds I've seen on I Catch Killers, and <laughs> we've had some huge turnarounds. But seriously, what you what you're doing is is quite impressive. What did? How did jail? Just before we finish part one, how did jail change you as a person? Like what, what, who was the Joe that went in and who was the Joe that came out? <clears throat> Look, you know, when, what I thought was an angry and kind of hardened uh, young man um, who wanted to do crime, you know, was actually someone who was crying out, um, crying out for help, you know. Mm. And like that was the only way that I could kind of solve issues, you know, um, it was also ignorance because I didn't know any better. I went to prison and really found myself, you know, yeah. not only through my faith, but through an understanding of myself going, okay, I actually became a man in jail, okay. you know, being able to Makes meet sense. other men and yeah. their, I guess, through their mistakes, yeah. um, came out a different person with a different understanding and different perspective on life, you know, um, and I was a much more positive individual. Remember I told you I was one angry little kid. Yeah. But, you know, through prison, I was a- able to understand um, gratitude um, and to be grateful for the little things in, in life because they, was, they were taken away from you. 
you know, I was able to um, set goals for myself, positive goals, um, and I was always grounded, you know, and always looking at the big picture, you know, um, there's bigger things out there that I can achieve. Um, that was just within, before my life was within a certain small circle. It was very ironic that I had to be locked up in a little cage to, to develop my mind, to look at, there's a bigger world out yeah. there. It's f so funny, right? <laughs> well, some, sometimes, sometimes we take the long way to the, get yeah. to the top, don't yeah. we? Yeah. And this, I came out, um, you know, fitness was a huge part of my transformation yeah. as well. Um, you know, I use fitness every day to not only stay positive, like today, like, you know, in Confi, my, uh, our slogan is train to be free. Yeah. Because even though our bodies were incarcerated, or my body was incarcerated, my mind used to be free whenever I used to train. So that's what we call oh, train to uh, be free. Uh, there's a, a therapeutic effect from uh, training. Yeah. If they're, they're locked up there. And you hear that time and time yeah. again from uh, people who have been inside. Definitely. Let's let's take a break now. And when yeah. we get back for part two, we're going to delve right into ComFit and yeah. everything else that you've been doing. So awesome. thanks for uh, sharing like a very personal story about yeah. the, the your, your start in life and uh, what uh, what got you in prison and who you were when you walked out of prison. So in part two, we're going to find out what that person did. Thanks, Cheers. Gary.